Business, government, and labor. Those three once held the power of the Canadian economy in their hands. It's still clearly true for the first two, but with automation, offshoring, and other substantial shifts in the workforce, is it still true of labor, as represented by the union movement? Let's find out with Tiffany Balducci. She is president of the Durham Region Labor Council and fourth VP of the Ontario Wing of CUPE, the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Dan Kelly, president and CEO, Canadian Federation of Independent Business. Stephanie Ross, Director and Associate Professor in the School of Labor Studies at McMaster University in Hamilton, and Ivan Ostos, a Fudora bike courier, hoping to unionize with CUPW, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. And we're delighted to welcome everybody here for the first time, except for Dan, who's been here before. A bunch of rookies here. That's very nice. We thank you for sharing your evening with us here on TVO. Let's just get up to scratch here. Sheldon, please bring this graphic up. This is unionization rates in Canada, the total workforce ages 17 to 64. We start in 1981 and then we go through to a few years ago. Let's say that in 2018, 28 plus percent of all Canadian employees aged 16 and over were unionized. That is a little misleading, so we're going to break it down some more because in effect, more than 70 percent of public sector employees were unionized and 14 percent of private sector employees are unionized. Having said that, there is more union penetration in Canada than in the United States. Again, in 2018, just 10.5% of American workers, 16 and over, were unionized. And that is down from 20% from 35 years ago. Only about a third of public sector workers there are unionized. And only about 6.5% of private sector workers in the States are unionized. Okay, let's get into this. Professor, I'm going to go to you first. If unions were a patient in hospital, how would you diagnose their current health given those numbers? Uh, well, I guess it depends on whether or not we want to say they're stable um, or um, maybe a little uh, peaked, a little pale. Um, I think there's you know, some, some truth to both of those diagnoses, right? I mean, you saw from the graph that um, really, from the late 1990s, union density, unionization rate, hasn't really gone down very much. It stayed around the 30% mark, up and down a little bit over those years. Um, it's down from its high, but there is a lot of stability in union representation in Canada. Um, but there, there is a reality that the, the labor movement is centered now in the public sector, right? 70% of the public sector is unionized. It means that a majority of union members are now in the public sector. It also interestingly means a majority of union members are women for, the, for, for quite a significant amount of time. And that's, that's a good news story, but it also uh, makes me very alarmed because the weakness in the private sector is a crisis, not just for workers in the private sector who need union representation, but for the labor movement as a whole and for Canadian society as a whole. Dan, this is where I bring you in since you represent business here on the program. Back in the day, and we're going, let's say, a century ago, sure. uh, the argument was made that unions were an absolute necessity, uh, particularly in private sector dangerous workplaces because you could lose life or limb yeah. uh, going to work in a very unsafe workplace. How much, in your view, do we still need unions today for that reason? Well, look, for starters, uh, I'm, I'm from Winnipeg originally, and I like to think that in 1919, I would have supported uh, the side of the unions uh, at, at that particular stage. I, I, I really do question, though, today, whether or not in the private sector there is much of a role for, for the labor movement in general. Uh, what I feel is that, that workers have never been more empowered than they are today. Employers right now, I mean, there's a, a crushing shortage of labor right now that is affecting the private sector. Private sector work employees are not just short of skilled workers, but increasingly unskilled uh, new entrants into the workforce in Canada. As a result, employers are bending over backwards to try to find roles uh, for people trying to meet their needs, help them with uh, all sorts of things that they never were involved in uh, before. So I think right now the, 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 the pendulum is on the side of the worker, not necessarily the side of the union. As a result, there is less need for unions today. In, a, in addition to that, I, I do believe that unions have been spectacularly successful in Canada in pushing a lot of the things that they used to confine to uh, collective agreements into public policy. So unions have pushed for a whole bunch of changes, minimum wage laws, uh, statutory holiday rules, 
that really have taken, I think, a lot of the benefits of belonging to a union and expanded it uh, to everybody. And so people are questioning, uh, well, do I really need to belong to a union since most of these things are guaranteed by law? Why don't you pick up on that, Tiffany? Sure, yeah, and um, just speaking to the law and the guarantees by law, unfortunately, in Ontario, we're actually seeing a clawback to things like health and safety legislation, uh, where uh, sadly, uh, just recently in Ajax, we had a worker killed on the job on a roof, and, and this is just you know last month, and this is happening all the time in today's day and age. Workers are going to work and not coming home because they're dying on the job. So they're just as relevant uh, from the health and safety perspective, uh, and, and far more so as far as we're talking about the growing inequities in the world. We're seeing the inequities that we did see in 1919, um, but even uh, worse because it's the precarious sector there too, so people are juggling multiple jobs, and if their multiple jobs are not unionized, they don't have the protections, um, they don't have the goal towards working towards a full-time position. And let's not forget the type of things that unions do in the communities to help out with the, to the communities, the social justice movement, working on things like what was noted before, the minimum wage. In terms of those, those jobs where, where unions help keep the, the workplace safe because the workplace may be a bit dangerous, you talked to, mm -hmm. gave a very sad example there a second mm -hmm. ago. There, there are plenty of people, mostly in the public sector, I think today, who are unionized who are in workplaces where, uh, I don't mean to be facetious here, but the biggest risk to their health they're probably facing is a paper cut. You know, these mm -hmm. are very clerical jobs where, and I suspect your union represents a lot of those folks as well. Do they really need the same kind of union protection that people who go down into mines or people who are building skyscrapers that they need? Sure, I, I wish that, I mean, I worked in libraries for a lot of years. I wish that the, the worst thing that I, I faced was a paper cut, although that is that was a job hazard at the library. <laughs> but, uh, but being a public sector worker, quite often the biggest risk that we face in the workplace is the public. Uh, and, and what we face from the public when we're, when we're serving the public in places like libraries and schools, we're seeing in hospitals, for example, you're seeing a rise in, in violence and, and uh, it's, it's a result of the despairs that people have in the world. But um, you know, people are being attacked at work by the folks that they're serving and that's not okay. And um, unions are there to help uh, facilitate these working conditions and make sure that people go to work safely and come home safely and that there are provisions there because we do have to serve the public. We, we love to serve the public, that's why we're public servants. Mm -hmm. But making sure that we have the protections in place, making sure we have the joint health and safety committees, the policies, what to do when something goes wrong and how do we address it. Okay. And yeah. Ivan, I'm gonna to get to you in a second, but I, I just wanna do one follow up with Dan here. You gave a long list of things that, that you say are happening even without very many people being unionized in, in this country right now. and. Part of the union agenda as well, for many unions anyway, is a kind of a social justice yeah. agenda that is, that is more than just local. In fact, it, it embraces global issues. What's your view on that? Well, look, if unions in Canada were voluntary, like they are in almost every other country in the world, I would, have, I would take no issue with the unions being heavily involved in the social policy agenda. I wouldn't certainly uh, dare to speak as to what a union or a group of members wish to do. They can spend as much time or as little time on whatever it happens to be. But I, I do believe that one of the reasons why the union density rate has, has declined in Canada is because unions are increasingly focusing on issues that don't bear a lot of resemblance to the concerns of their members on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, and I think that that, you know, if I, if I were giving some advice to unions, it, it might be to, to, stick to, the, to stick to the main job of collective bargaining on behalf of their members as opposed to getting involved in anti-Israel uh, uh, BS uh, at, at international tribunals, I think you uh, mean, which happens I, all the time. I, I all think you time. mean BDS. Uh, well, <laughs> actually, I did mean BS, but that's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but these, okay. Kinds of, these are the kinds of things that I think alienate a lot of, of potential union members from belonging to or, or supporting their individual union. Okay, Stephanie well, is doing a great job yeah. preventing the steam from coming out of her ears <laughs> right now, but, but, but like go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, but but oh. if, just, if I just could, okay. I think that actually the evidence that we have shows that that's not actually correct, that, that Canadians actually see the labor movement playing a really important uh, social justice role. They support that role for unions. And in fact, it, I think it is a contradictory position because often unions are criticized for only looking out for their own members, right? By focusing only on collective bargaining. Many people criticize unions for quote unquote selfishly putting their own economic interests ahead of 
you know, uh, customers or um, uh, recipients of services. And uh, so I think that they're, in, in this logic, they're kind of trapped. Um, either they only focus on the narrow bread and butter issues, or they have a broader social justice role that is uh, in the public interest. And I, I just think it's not an accurate reflection of what Canadians expect and want from the labor movement, what motivates people to unionize, which actually increasingly is about dignity and it is about respect and it is about the transformation of the broader society okay, as well, well as their own economic situation. Let's find out from a guy who's actually trying to do that, trying to unionize. Thanks yeah. for your patience, Ivan. Um, so what I would say is, um, for example, I'm an organizer just organizing bike couriers uh, in Toronto, Fudora bike couriers, yet uh, Cup W, the Union of Postal Workers, is supporting us. They had a huge rally where I, I was shown so much support from these postal workers whose jobs, you know, in a sense, don't really have anything to do with my struggle. Um, so really what that shows me is that people understand that uh, these issues go across uh, Canadian society. And they see that, you know, when uh, other workers are being taken advantage of, that brings everyone down. So it's actually advantageous for everyone to uh, support other workers in their precarious conditions, regardless of how close together they are. Um, going back to something you said earlier, Dan, um, something like my job, you know, I feel like I'm almost back in 1919. That's why, like, this is so important to someone like me. You know, uh, I meet bike couriers every day who are injured on the job, or they have close calls, or their, you know, their bikes get stolen. There's just so many issues um, of can, violence. Ivan, and, can we understand that a little better? How many hours a day are you on that bike? Um, I mean, I work 40 hours a week, so probably a good chunk of that, like 30-ish, is on okay. the bike. And, how and I ride everywhere anyway, so. Right. <laughs> yeah. You wear a helmet? Yeah. Good. How dangerous is your job? Really dangerous. I think it's more dangerous than uh, being a police officer or a construction worker or a fireman because we simply don't have any of the protections or respect that those professions get. What's happened to you on the roads? Well, for me, I mean, I broke my arm in September. How? Um, I was cycling on the bike path, believe it or not, and I just got uh, in a collision with another cyclist. Um, with another cyclist? Yeah, with another cyclist. Okay, I was waiting for you to tell the story about how somebody opened their door on I you. I know. And that... That's happened to me, too, but uh, yeah. didn't break my arm those times. Um, were you on the job when you broke yes. your arm? You were. So that was a... I mean, could you file a WSIB claim or I something did, like that? and yeah? it was okay. awful. Um, <laughs> you know, I ended up getting $210 a week. How helpful was your employer in all that? Really minimal, bare bones. Like, they, they have to help me. Uh, Fudora has to give uh, the WSAV information, but they didn't do anything more than what they had to other than, like, a couple emails. If you are successful in your drive to have a union represent you and your fellow cyclists, couriers, excuse me, uh, how will that change your life? Drastically. I mean, we, we could argue that um, well, we, we deserve uh, adequate safety and protections. I mean, uh, we could get health benefits that, you know, people in the office get, yet people who work in the streets doing the dangerous labor don't get. You know, we have no say right now in how we're paid. Uh, meanwhile, uh, inflation goes up, cost of living goes up in Toronto, rent goes up. So um, we're, we're kind of in a downward spiral right now, and the only answer to that that I can see is uh, labor stepping up uh, and speaking out for their issues, which is a, a union. I want to try this with you, Stephanie. How useful do you think unions have been at modernizing um, in order to meet the challenge of, I guess, what we'd, we'd call your job part of the gig economy, right? Yeah. It's, it, these are hardly sort of like permanent, full-time, regular um, jobs. It's, you know, you kind of work when there's work and you don't when, when you don't, I guess, that kind of uh -huh. thing. Uh, Uber's drivers are in the same situation. How well have unions responded to this new part of the economy? I think that's a weakness. I think that in Canada, um, you know, maybe it's a it's a product of the relative stability of our labor movement is that there there hasn't been as much focus on new organizing, especially in the growing sectors of the economy, whether it's private services, which has been growing for you know forty years, um, or the specific gig economy situation where people are working on platforms. So I, I think that unions um, are in some ways stuck in 
certain habits that are reinforced by our labor legislation, which says that, you know, in order to get union representation, you need to organize in a particular workplace. And the gig economy just isn't organized that way. And it's very difficult to see how we can have forms of union representation that are specific to a particular workplace or a spe specific employer where people are going to be moving around the economy quite a lot. Benefits, entitlements need to move around with them. Um, and so our, our models of representation, which the law actually reinforces, aren't really adequate to the gig economy. And I, I'd like to say that CUPW's initiatives on this are more common, but I would say that they're not. So it is a real strategic weakness that we need, the labor movement needs to take more but seriously. I, but I don't, I actually don't believe that that's a, a fault of unions. It might surprise you to, to, <laughs> to hear me say that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with you that the conclusion is the unions have been spectacularly unsuccessful in representing the self-employed, but I, I don't think that that's the fault of the unions. I think that's the reality of the fact that most people, and stats can just put out some new data on this, most people who are self-employed want to be self-employed. They want to be a company of their own and, and set their own, uh, their own path. In fact, it was five, StatCan data showed that only 5% of those that are self-employed are doing it because they uh, lack a full-time job, that they would prefer to have a full-time job with benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And the vast majority, I'm not suggesting that there are zero people in that case, but that, that there are very few. The vast majority of those that are self-employed are doing it because they want the freedom and flexibility. And a whole bunch of millennials don't want to be tied to a 40 hour a week job sitting in an office somewhere. They want to be doing work where they can work for a variety, with a variety of people, do some perhaps paid employment, some self-employment, make to a respond job to that. on their own. It's interesting yeah. that you bring up millennials actually, because um, you know I, I personally am a, a millennial, but uh, millennials, when uh, uh, yeah, research actually shows <laughs> that millennials by and large are one of the age groups that vastly support unionization understand. and the labor yeah. movement. And it's because the economy has been joining. bad our entire lives. Like we've heard our, our whole lives how bad the economy is. And we see unions as one of the only ways that um, you know softens the blow of capitalism really mm -hmm. and, and makes a voice up for everyone and pools together the worker power. So mm -hmm. I think um, you know numbers are numbers, but the research does show that, that millennials do support uh, unions, and I'm sure Ivan. T Tiffany's quite right in, to, in that you know young workers have a much higher propensity than their older counterparts to be interested in unionization. Sure. It's not a question. Except not for themselves. No, quite for themselves. But the the labor market that they face is very difficult to unionize. Mm. Yes. And and I, and I would I would contest your characterization of someone like Ivan as self-employed. Mm -hmm. Ivan is not self-employed. He's very clearly employed by uh, an employer who has misclassified him as an independent contractor. And indeed, that is the, the problem with platform work, is that the, the business model is based upon misclassification of employees precisely so that those employers can skirt legal uh, entitlements, whether it's in employment standards or in uh, Labor Relations Act. And uh, in fact, California legislature declared that Uber and other platform uh, employers are employers but this is of why employees. Union, this okay, is why yeah. unions are a bit stuck is 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 precisely what you're talking about and that point of view that we're that we have this kind of industrial economy where everybody goes to a big manufacturing job or a or a full-time office job governed by and, a collective and, agreement by, governed by a collective agreement and i think unions are just so stuck in the mentality and have have almost forgotten <laughs> that the world has shifted primarily because people don't wish to be organized that way anymore. I got And, it. I and got especially it. younger people, yeah. they are voting with their feet. They're creating their own jobs. It is tough to find workers these days for employers who have full-time jobs on offer. We just did a, a study that showed that there are 400,000 positions in small and medium-sized firms that have been sitting vacant for four months or more. Why? Uh, it primarily because they are struggling, there, there are fewer new entrants into the workforce. And I believe that we are moving into an environment, despite technology and all the changes that it's making, that workers are gonna be more empowered than, they're ever, than they ever were because there are fewer of them and employers mm. are, 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 are struggling to find them. Ivan. Yeah, I mean, it's true that um, uh, 
people in the platform economy are totally misclassified to the advantage of the employer. So, um, you know, the I, I understand what you're saying, Dan, in saying that people who are self-employed want to be self-employed. The thing is that it's kind of including people who are self-employed, but that's just uh, well, they're, what they've been given. They're not really self I'm not really self-employed when uh, I have to choose shifts and like the only hours I can get are the hours Fudor gives me or if I'm an Uber driver and uh, the only times I can make money are the dinner rushes, you know, am I really choosing my own schedule? You know, do I really have a say in how much money I make? Um, all of that is based, that's a bunch of BS. Um, uh, and you don't mean BDS. You no, mean BDS. no. <laughs> okay. uh, but, you know, I think you're also right, though, in saying that unions kind of have, um, they're, they're, they're old. Uh, a lot of them, you know, uh, they haven't kept up with this new platform generation. And that's why there's people like me who are younger, who were never exposed to unions as kids. Um, I, I, nobody in my family was really involved in unions, but the people I talked to doing my job, you know, reaching out to bike careers, it's the young people who really understand like, oh, like that they are totally new to the idea of unions and they love it because they see that, oh, this is what I've actually needed my whole life. Let me ask Tiffany uh, a political question here, which is how much political influence do you think unions to this day have, for example, to elect who they want to elect, to unelect who they don't like, to have policy put in place that they want to see, or to stop policy through protests that they don't want to see? Sure. When people uh, tell me that you know unions are just too powerful, my answer is always, you know, I wish we were as powerful as people uh, give us credit <laughs> for. I really do, because I mean, uh, one in eight people in Canada are a QP member, I believe. Do you mean one in eight unionized members, or yeah, one, one in eight, eight unionized members? Okay. Yeah, in, in Canada is uh, is a QP member, um, and uh, they, yeah, and if, so if we all voted the same way collectively. You would see QP's agenda everywhere, I would, I would think, uh, or at least the public sector agenda. So I, I do wish we were as powerful as people thought we were. I do agree that uh, the labor movement has uh, fallen behind in a lot of ways as far as, uh, as building power, building, um, you know, taking to the streets, uh, taking collective action. Uh, we are seeing now more than ever, though, in Ontario anyway, um, one of the good things that happens when a right-wing government is elected is that you see a resistance that starts to form. Well, let me ask Stephanie about that. In fact, mm -hmm. it will be a year tomorrow <clears throat> that the Ford government was elected in a, in a real thrashing of the previous government, which was much more friendly to unions. How, how has the election of the Ford government changed life for unionized people in the province? Well, I, Tiffany's quite right. I mean, all of the resistance to all of the various policy measures, none of which actually were discussed in the election, by the way, mm -hmm. um, has been spearheaded or supported by unions. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what, what do we see a year later? 75% of Ontarians are, are not impressed with this government. So I think that actually shows a great deal of political influence over the public discourse and over a people's conception of this, of this government and of governments in general. Um, but of course, as Tiffany said, right, you, uh, this, there's a unifying aspect to having uh, a government that is actually attacking many sectors in the labor movement and in the community that the labor movement is strongly connected to. Um, and so it provides the basis for a kind of uh, cross-union alliance that isn't necessarily there when there's a more uh, pro-labor government in place, actually. Dan, and would you agree that the current government of Ontario is far more interested in what you have to say than what she has to say? Uh, yeah, I would say that that's, that's likely true, but uh, the opposite was true only a year ago, right? And, and that the business community was almost entirely dismissed in, in, in any of its views or positions on, on really any topic whatsoever. And, and really it was, what else, could the, what else could you possibly give you, union movement? Uh, because that's what we'd like to do, and that's how we'd like to get elected. There's lots um, of things we yeah. could have had. Actually, <laughs> many, many well, more look, things. Uh, I, I do, I do agree with you, though, that uh, that you, the union movement has been spectacularly successful in achieving its agenda through public policy means. And I do think that that is, in some part, is some part the reason why union density has gone down. The the governments have given unions so much of what they traditionally have uh, focused on in collective agreements, into public policy. And, and even when governments like the current Ontario government do scale some of that back, as they did with uh, reversing Bill 148 here in Ontario, 
um, still, uh, I would say that no government in Canada has, has, has taken on unions in any big or major way. No government has introduced right-to-work legislation or even flirted with it uh, in any significant way well, Tim Hudak in, in ran, Canada. Tim they Hudak talked, they talk, talked, talked about, about it, wanting to do it and then but, he backed down. But what happened? Not, nothing happened. And, and the idea of, you know, and, and on so many ideas that, 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 that even right-of-center governments have introduced, they end up... Uh, softening or eliminating as a result of protests, in part because of <laughs> unions. The, the unions are incredibly powerful still, as your evidence showed, in the public sector. And it is public sector unions that I think that have great sway and influence over public policy. And I don't know that that's a good thing uh, for, for Canada as a whole. Uh, there is too much influence from, from the labor movement. And that is, I think, largely due to the fact that, that unions have this incredibly coercive power given to them by governments uh, to require union dues, even from those that don't wish Let to Let me pick up on that. Let me pick up on that. Because, I th are you referring to the RAND formula yeah. again? Okay. Like, yeah. Okay. So this is, yeah. let's just go back about, is it 40 years, 45 years, something right. like that? In the province of Ontario, uh, a judge by the name of RAND uh, made a decision that has... Uh, persisted to this day, uh, where we have something called the RAND formula. Mm -hmm. And that means that even if you don't belong to the union, uh, you got to pay union dues if you're uh, doing a particular job uh, where other people are, in fact, unionized, because you can't be, I guess the expression is, a free rider. You mm -hmm. can't take all the benefits of being in the union, uh, but not join the union. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some Politicians have wanted to chip away at that over the years, but the RAND formula has persisted. Uh, I know you probably like it. I know you probably like it. I know you probably like it. What do you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you won't, I won't surprise you then, Steve, to say that uh, that we do think that it is it is high time that that be revisited in Canada. Whether the legal constructs would allow that to even happen, I don't know. What would but, be the implications of doing so? Well, for one thing, I actually think it, it would probably be the best thing for unions themselves so? for their future. One of the reasons why unions have been, uh, have been less successful, especially in the private sector, is because they don't really have to do very much. They have this locked in uh, base and unions can be fat and happy and, and really not do much to serve their individual members on the issues and concerns that they really have. Uh, nowhere else in the world, other than a few U.S. states, uh, are you required to pay union dues if you actually work in an environment. Nowhere, I, I started out thinking when I was looking at this at first that Canada's union laws were somewhere between, say, the U.S. and Europe. Uh, and to my shock, there is no one in Europe that is required to pay union sure. dues and if they Europe, don't wish to. And in Europe, you see wildcat strikes as a, a, that happens you, as a result of that. Strikes happen. But union, but union reasons, density is much higher. One of the things higher. that we traded off in the labor movement for the RAND formula was free collective bargaining, which means while there's a collective agreement in place, we cannot go on strike. Once that collective agreement is in place sure. for three years or whatever, or we're in negotiations, there is a time period yeah, in which we can go on Yeah, but talk to Ontario parents so or talk to consumers strike. of postal services. So, they wouldn't feel like that's giving them that very much. But they were on a wildcat strike. It was a totally legal strike. Yeah. But I do agree with you the on the fact that it can be a good thing in places where there are, um, you know, I'm from the States originally. You see uh, when the right to work laws are introduced, you actually see unions become stronger yeah, I, I, because yeah, people absolutely. will go back to having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with their membership and talking to them about the importance of the union and why it's very important to be involved. Let me get Stephanie on this just with a few minutes left, Stephanie. The, if, if any government in Ontario tried to get rid of the RAND formula, what would be the implications for workers in your view? Well, I mean, it would have a negative effect on unions as organizations, at least in the short term, right? Mm -hmm. there, are, there are a number of people in every union that because the, the, the law allows for you to pay dues but not be a member. Right. So those folks, th th those dues would go away probably. And so that would be financially significant. Um, and it's precisely why Rand um, came to this decision, right? Rand was trying to find a compromise between uh, the, coll the democratic collective rights mm -hmm. of a group of workers who in majority had voted for a union and wanted their democratic will to be carried forward. That requires a functional union. Yep. And it requires people not to undermine the work mm -hmm. of that union in order for that to be meaningful. Uh, but to balance that with individual rights to not uh, be a member of an organization that they didn't want to be involved in. And later contests around that have ha went to the Supreme Court, right, in 1991. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're very well aware of sure. Levine versus Opsu, that case, where the Supreme Court decided that RAND was constitutional. It did not limit anybody's political speech, mm -hmm. even if one's dues were in part going to political activity, because the court said that unions 
political activity actually is central to their core collective bargaining function. Yeah, but what it's I'm actually central to their capacity to deliver good public policy that supports unionization, not to mention that many issues that working class people have can't be solved in, mm -hmm. the, in the specific workplace. Quick response you need yeah. public my, policy My quick response is when I was 17 and working in a grocery store in Winnipeg, uh, my first thought about the union, I was a member of UFCW at the time. Food and commercial that, workers. Food, food and commercial workers. Was that, that I had, but that my union dues were going to fight the free trade agreement, that was the debate of the time, uh, that I disagreed with. And, that was, and they were being used to support a political party that I didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. And that was the formation of my views over, you know, at, uh, way back when. And I have to tell you that the more unions do politicking, the more they get into some of these uh, public policy issues, I think they run the risk of alienating a larger group of Canadians. Well, let me read potential this. Potential clients. Let me read this here. This is from Politico magazine, and uh, Bill Sher, contributing editor, had this to say uh, last year. He said, "Unions are to the left what coal is to the right. Hmm. Nostalgia." a powerful symbol of past glory offering tantalizing hope for today's problems despite slowly dying in front of our eyes. Okay, Tiffany, you want to push back on that? Sure. I mean, I well, I do disagree with that, but I, I can say that uh, there are a number of things that unions do need to do in order to stay relevant. Like what? And, uh, well, speaking of coal, one of the things would be uh, signing on to a Green New Deal, embracing um, the idea that, uh, you know, sometimes you hear the narrative, uh, it's jobs versus climate justice. But there are no jobs on a dead planet, and we need to come together and work together on some exciting initiatives on how we can look at, you know, these new technologies, you know, electric cars, that type of thing. You know, I'm a Labor Council president that represents Oshawa. We would love to retool the plant in Oshawa, put it under workers' control, and, you know, get some electric vehicles made there, a whole fleet of vehicles, maybe postal worker vehicles. Like, there's things that we can do that are really exciting um, that, you know, we see that are extremely popular in, in the States with things like you hear, uh, you know, folks like Bernie Sanders speaking about these things, and it's building, um, you know, very, like, ex extreme interest, and we're getting there, but we have to make sure that we're letting uh, folks lead the way that haven't historically led the way in the labor movement as well. I will say that. The labor movement um, has largely been led by men that look very similar to each other, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we need to let you know young folks, uh, historically underrepresented folks in the labor movement, uh, lead the way, but lead the way from the grassroots, like member-led, not, not, not this top-down approach. So I will say, in order to stay relevant, we'll, we will need to tackle a few things, but I think we can get there, and I think we'll see uh, union pop popularity to increase. Ivan, I've got 30 seconds left here. Any concerns as you try to unionize your couriers, any concerns that, you know, the internecine warfare in the union movement as one fights the other for members can be pretty intense. You want to embrace all of that? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not so sure that's a real concern when the union hasn't formed yet in the platform mm -hmm. economy. You know, uh, the way I see it, it's like uh, the union is very relevant to people's needs right now. Like, they see that there is no, no basis for job security or wage security or anything. Um, the idea of unions infighting between each other for membership, uh, I mean, like... You'll worry about that when the time comes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you got it. That's our time, everybody. Thanks so much for this. Tiffany Balducci and Ivan Ostos on this side of the table here. Dan Kelly and Stephanie Ross on the other side of the table. We're grateful to all of you for a very civilized discussion here in TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.